Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this session um, with uh, an interview of Stacy Holman Jones. So let me walk through Stacy a little bit and uh, do some fussing to borrow Barry's words, uh, and then tell you uh, start out just having some conversation. Um, so the stuff you probably know about Stacy, it gives me it it gives me great honor and pleasure to do this interview. As as um, if you know any of uh, her work and my work, it's it's really tied together. Um, so this is really some of it. This is a really cool opportunity. Um, many of you know. I, I'm confident that many of you know Stacy, or at least know of her work. Um, she is a writer, a director, a researcher, and educate cater at the Sir Zelman Cowan School of Music and Performance at Monash University. Uh, in terms of work, she's published 13 solo co-authored edited books and more than 100 articles, book chapters, reviews, editorials. Of course, she has indeed, indeed developed an international, international reputation for leading the development of autoethnography and performance, feminist and sexuality studies, and innovative and critical art space methodologies. Her writing, directing, and performance work has been featured in several events and venues in Australia, New Zealand, United States, and Scotland. And she is the founding editor of Departures in Critical Qualitative Research, a journal dedicated to publishing innovative experience experimental aesthetic and provocative works on the theories, practices, and possibilities of critical qualitative research. It is a very autoethnographic and narrative friendly journal. And she's one of the founders of the Critical Autoethnography Conference, now entering its ninth, yeah. ninth year? Oh my ninth year, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, what you may not know is that I first met Stacy um, at the University of South Florida in 2004, nearly 20, Nearly 20 years. That's so weird. Uh, I was a doctoral student. She was a professor. I never took a class with her. But midway through my graduate program, she asked me, she, a student, and one she didn't know too well at all, to collaborate uh, on a book chapter for the Handbook of Critical and Indigenous Methodologies. That's Stacy. You know, Stacy, that's Stacy. And I think you asked me at the fall 2000 academic orientation. Is that right? And you asked me if I wanted to co-author a chapter on something queer or something autoethnography or what became something both. And well, we've collaborated a lot since that initial ask. We've edited a special issue of Liminalities. We've co-authored, by my count, three articles, three encyclopedia entries, seven book chapters, and most recently, a chapter for the forthcoming sixth edition of the Handbook of Qualitative Research. And with Carolyn Ellis, we've edited two books of the Handbook of Autoethnography, and we wrote a book about autoethnography. I sure wouldn't be here, or at least the Tony I am now, without the Stacy, without Stacy. And of course, she's helped me navigate grief and loss and has shown me how to survive tense and terrible families of origin. She's pushed me creatively, theoretically, has gifted me comfort and courage, and has taught me so much about artistic craft and passion. So thank you, Stacy. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for the collaborative us. And I'm honored to be here now with you for this session spotlighting and celebrating you and your work. So thank you, happy to be here. Thank you, thank you, Tony. It's gonna to be great. So here's what we've, we, there's the structure for the session. I have a few questions I wanna ask, ask Stacy. Um, I sent most of these in advance, but I did refine a few uh, to slight surprises, but not nothing too, too terrible. Uh, I hope. <laughs> um, I figured we would talk for about 30, 35 minutes and then see what other folks had to say. And folks, this is your time with, with Stacy Holman Jones, and we'll see where we, we go with this, with this structure. Um, so please don't be shy when we get to get to that period. But um, cool. Are you ready, Stacy? I'm up. I'm ready. I'm, I'm absolutely ready. Thank you. Cool, cool. Well, so let's start with a very general. How did you come to autoethnography? 
especially or tied to your academic background, which it was in is in performance studies and theater. How does where does autoethnography fit with with that world? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question um, to open with. Um, and and before I before I dive in, I I just want to um, acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians of the unceded lands on which I'm coming to you today, the peoples of the Kulin Nation. I want to acknowledge them as traditional owners and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging um, of these and all the lands on which we're working and living um, um, uh, today. Uh, and I'd also like to welcome any First Nations people who are, are with us today um, at the conference. Um, okay, so how, how did I come to autoethnography? Um, uh, and how does it fit in with my training? It's such a, a good question. And um, and you know, I mean, I think Tony, thank you so much too for that that beautiful introduction. And and I just want to uh, say um, how much I have grown and benefited from my working really and personal relationship with you. How much joy it's brought to me. Um, how tied up it is with my experience of autoethnography um, and certainly my work at us so many people on this screen um, who i've met through that community and art and carolyn um, so i i got him yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess my first experience with autoethnography um, really happened when I um, met my then master's um, uh, advisor, one of them, Nick Trujillo at Cal State Sacramento, um, and took took a class in ethnography um, in the communication studies department. And Nick is the person who taught me how to love and do field work um, and how to treat the act of writing field notes and ethnographic stories as a really important part of that process. Uh, one that included grappling with our subjectivities as writers and, and our point of view and, and really paying attention to and honing our writing skills as part of the craft of storytelling. So he really inspired me to, as he always said to me, just write the story um, with, you know, the just being a whole lot of, a whole lot of um, time and attention and love and care. Um, and then I went off and did my PhD at the University of Texas. Um, and there I met the uh, wonderful and generous Kathleen Stewart, um, uh, took a class with her in the anthropology department. Um, and Kathleen really taught me how to think broadly about the um, place and the form of criticism in writing about culture, um, as well as the importance of paying attention to affect and the or the ineffable and to everyday experience. And those two teachers, Nick and Katie, um, they both wrote alongside us when I, when I was studying um, and they shared their writing with us. Um, uh, so it was always part of a process and a community um, of sharing and engagement. And I really, um, I really learned a lot from them about the fact that scholarship and research is, is an ongoing, uh, changing and mutable thing. It doesn't come to you fully formed and it doesn't stay still. Um, and so to see their work kind of uh, unfold over time helps me understand that um, that my life as a researcher and a scholar was going to be one of change. Um, and to really make that process manifest in the work was something that was really important. Um, and also during my time at the University of Texas, I was trained uh, by and alongside theater and performance scholars. So um, Joni or, or Omi Osun Jones, uh, Lynn Miller, Paul Gray, all of my amazing performance studies colleagues there, Deanna Shoemaker, um, as well as performance uh, studies colleagues, um, including Craig Gingrich Philbrook, Tammy Spry, Bryant Keith Alexander. Um, who, you know, reinforced that message that scholarship was an event. Um, rather than an accomplishment. Um, it's in process and it's changing and changeable. So um, that idea of performance as an event is something that happens in time, um, unfolds across time, um, really just translated into my, into my writing. Um, and uh, the idea that we 
um, we can work as scholars to make um, the concepts or the experiences that we're interested in happen in the writing. Um, or we can think about the work that we're doing um, as a performance or an experience that happens on the page, um, what we might refer to as, as performative writing. And of course, as part of that journey, um, and, I, and I thank and credit Nick to introducing me to um, Carolyn uh, and Art, who also introduced me to Laurel and to Norman Denzen, um, and the friendship and community that happened um, immediately in the olden days when we used to do uh, write letters. I have a typewritten letter that Carolyn um, and Art sent to Nick, um, who sort of very, uh, in his very Nick Trujillo way, just without my really, my without a lot of discussion, sent off my master's thesis to Art and Carolyn to read because he thought he thought they needed to have some input and have a look at it. Um, and um, and I still have that letter, um, Carolyn and Art. I, I just uh, was looking for some papers for my daughter the other day and I came across it um, in a folder. So, um, so we've had a very long and joyful uh, cor correspondence and friendship. And I really think of Art and Carolyn as, uh, as part of my family. Um, they certainly took me under their wings when I, when I finished my PhD and moved to the University of South Florida. Um, and they were great colleagues to me, but they were also my family. <laughs> they gave me a place to live and they loved me. Um, and they made sure that my life, um, you know, uh, unfolded in, in all the beautiful and wonderful ways that it has. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, so I, I, I'm getting back to the question, Tony. I think, um, I think that one of the things that that my training has taught me is just really how much um, autoethnography can hold um, the dynamics of what it means to live as a human being on this planet. Um, and it's one of the things that I think has sustained this community across time. Um, I just heard the very end of the last panel and just hearing people's beautiful words about how their experience, you know, they, they've made experiences that have been hard for them, but they see they see themselves in relation with larger communities and, and with this community, but also um, in their lives. And that and that is a sustaining um, and and growing place that people can find themselves. Um, and I can't think of a better way to live a life in a profession, um, certainly in the academy than, than doing the work that we've been doing. I hope I answered some of that. <laughs> you sure did. So I want to I want to uh, take a go a bit sideways with there. So um, in 1997, you published that <laughs> co-auto ethnographic essay, "Fragments of Self," at the Postmodern Bar, uh, mm -hmm. which stemmed from your work with Nick uh, yeah. in Co Communication Studies 298. What are some things? that you would tell Stacy that student in that course uh, where you are now what would you what are some things you <laughs> what would I tell me what would I tell me um uh well I think I had a sense of this and I just want to say that was one of Nick's you know commitments is that we were all going to write this this we're going to publish yeah. something you know, he, he, he really wanted us to have that experience together. It felt really scary to me. Um, I thought, what do you know, what do we know? Um, uh, he really wanted us to publish under the, under the author's name, Communication Studies 298. Um, and just as a sidebar, Tony, it makes me think about when we thought we would come up with a pen name for you and me together, you know, <laughs> yes. some kind of mashup of our two names. Yeah. Um, and I guess I would tell my younger self, um, you know, don't spend so much time being afraid. He was a really, he was a really generous um, uh, teacher and, um, and we were in very good hands with him. Um, and he was, he had his ideas about things for sure, um, but he let everybody grow into their own in that, in writing that article together. So I, I just, um, I would have, I did pay attention. I would have paid even closer <laughs> attention to how he nurtured each one of us individually into our own kind of writing voices. Um, and maybe the other thing I would have told myself um, is um, you will be in conversation with many, if not all of these people for, for the rest of your life. Like I'm still 
it connected to so many of the people that I was in that um, that master's unit level class in 19, that would have been 1990, maybe five um, wow. when, we, when we did that. Um, uh, Rona Huluwilani was part of that group, Donna Nifong. I mean, I've got, I still have relationships with those, with those people um, all these years, you know, 30, 30 plus years later, um, which is really a gift as well. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, cool. So you, you've written so much. Uh, if I, if you had to identify one, maybe two of your favorite autoethnographic projects, um, what would they be? And maybe even what what made them special, interesting, or meaningful? Um, for you? Mm -hmm. That's a lot. just really unfair and hard question, Tony. To ask. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I think. So I'm going to cheat a little bit because, you know, yeah. we could, I mean, so I, I think, and these are related, like I did, I did sort of keep myself the two groups of things, if you will. And one of them is, is the work that we started doing together um, in that first article. And then mm -hmm. I feel that that's very much connected to the work that you, Carolyn, and I have done together, um, which is about um thinking hard and lay, trying to lay out some of the qualities or features of autoethnography, maybe in relation to other things. So, so some of the early work we did, Tony, was to bring together queer studies and queer theory and autoethnography and just thinking through what are these what do these approaches and practices have in common? What are different? You know, what happens when you bring them together? Um, those encyclopedia entries, which listen, I just want to say they seem like small projects that maybe, you know, in an institutional or, you know, uh, uh, way don't seem to count very much, but they're, they're the most important things I think that we have done uh, in some respects, because they're the first place that people encounter what this methodology is and where you get, I don't know if people here on the screen, but where you get the kind of tingly, like, oh my gosh, this is the thing that I could do. It sounds like it's just for me. Um, and so those are really important things. And of course the handbooks, nurturing those, those works along um, and being good editors together. Um, and then that our little green book that uh, Oxford University Press autoethnography book was so fun. That was fun. And so hard to write because it's it was we worked we really worked hard together to make the doing of autoethnography not only accessible but also exciting to people. And I feel really proud of the ways that we've tried to um, share what we know and what we believe uh, in ways that people can then take up and make their own. I think that that's been, you know, that's been my heart work. That's my life work. Um, and so that's one group of, of things that, that I've done. I feel really has been meaningful to me personally, but also I feel really proud of, you know, it's not, you know, I mean, life is long and you write things and sometimes you go back and think, oh my gosh, I could have done or I wish I had or whatever. But I don't feel that way about any of those projects, I have to say. I just think, oh gosh, we, we, we really had something going there. You know, we sound, we sound like we know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, awesome. And then I guess related to that, you know, is the kind of cluster of work that we've done together, Tony, um, that's really around uh, queerness, coming out, grief and loss. And that flows into my work that I've done um, around family. Uh, the, the essays I've written around adoption um, that were published in TPQ, um, uh, John and Ke Keith Berry would be aware, uh, John, John Warren, the Crimes Against Experience essay that mm -hmm. we did in the special issue That's of correct. Cultural Studies, Critical Methodologies, thinking about what evidence is in autoethnography. Um, and even the living bodies of thought uh, uh, about critical autoethnography, which is really about my coming out and my relationship with my dad. Um, and those things feel related, but I'm really, they were very meaningful to me personally, but they also, I think, um, help people see what the relationship of the personal is with the political. 
Um, and um, in thinking about talking to you today, I decided that what I think is important about the work that we're doing in autoethnography um, is really around compassion. I mean, autoethnography mm. is kind of a compassion machine and um, you can't <laughs> understand experience of people who might be different or that have been othered in some way in the world um, without compassion. And once we build a bridge with compassion, we can change things. Um, it's hard It's hard to kind of persist wow. in, a, in an oppressive or violent uh, relationship if you're in a space of compassion. And I think that's really, that's really what I learned doing that. Love it. So I have a, another question. You can pass uh, on this if you don't want, but related, <laughs> related to the favorite work, if you had, if you could think of uh, some of your work, which, which story, which writing do you think has felt has made you feel the most exposed or or vulnerable? Is there one that you that you just go to? And you can pass. We can. No, no, no. I mean, I think um, you know, one of the things that we've said collectively, and yeah. I've said that, you know, you have to, you have to, you take the choice to make yourself vulnerable or exposed yeah. uh, purposefully. And so I don't want to pass, you know, I, um, I don't want to pass on that question. Um, I think that probably, uh, and, and, be, and this probably makes sense, um, uh, is the writing that I've done around transnational adoption and my, my kind of naive entry into that and my role and my participation in that really violent system. Um, I have uh, a daughter who, oh my gosh, is going to be 21 in two weeks. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, and I treasure my relationship with her. She's, you know, she's changed my life in all the, all the most beautiful ways. And yet that relationship is the product of a really, really awful system. Um, and she is, um, you know, the trauma that she carries as part of that system is something that I have participated in. Um, and so I think that that's been really difficult to grapple with in an honest way um, and not a kind of saccharine or let myself off the hook way. I don't know that I've gotten there with that work. Um, um, it's done a couple of things. I've had, I've had, um, uh, difficult relationships with adoptees who have wanted to do autoethnographic doctoral work across my career. Um, we make connections based on that work. And then there, there have come moments when my role as an adoptive mother in that system has meant that we ha can't continue our work together, um, which has been, which has been understandable and also really hard um, to let those relationships change and go in some respects and in some instances. Um, and so um, the ethics of doing that work, especially around writing about my daughter across her life. Um, she was a baby when I started that uh, work and oh, my screen's going kind of bonkers. Let me see, I don't know. <laughs> and um, you know, she's an adult now, and certainly she, her opinions and ideas about my writing about her <laughs> have changed over time. And so that's an ongoing conversation. And I think ethics is always an ongoing yeah. conversation. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we've gone from her being quite excited about uh, being, uh, being a featured character in the work that I've done, <laughs> to, you know, to her saying, you do not have my permission to write about me or certain things about my life. And I certainly understand that, but it's, you know, those have been, those have been difficult sometimes conversations to have. I'm, I'm glad I've had them, but um, yeah. So I think that probably is my answer there. Cool. So yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so much of your work and across your career, you have, an, especially with the critical component, uh, but even in work that may not be as explicitly critical. Social justice is a key part uh, of so much of what you what you do. What in what ways do you see autoethnography assisting with activism, contributing to social justice? What, what are those connections for you? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, thanks for asking this one. Um, uh, I think I've said a little bit about this uh, already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if if I, I think autoethnography and and we've written a, a quite a bit about this, Tony. Mm -hmm. So uh, so you you jump in uh, to, um, you know, if autoethnography connects the personal and political. Um, it, and how does it do that? Um, it gives us really specific and concrete examples um, in an engaging form, uh, you know, of the form of a story um, of how uh, culture and so larger systems of oppression and liberation can work. So it helps us make those connections um, and it does so in ways that move us emotionally as well as practically, and in some cases, physically. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna think about how social justice or social movements happen, you know, they are in motion. And so I think that, that, that those connections help us, help put us in motion uh, sometimes. So, and that could be inspiring people to write their own stories and then connecting with other people who have similar experiences. Um, and there you're starting to build communities and you need communities to, to um, act together to make meaningful change. Um, and, you know, I mean, one of the things we all probably on this screen know this, people will come to us and think that autoethnography is about the personal only. Um, I mean, I, I joke, I, I don't mean to be, um, to be sort of flippant when I say, I just wanna make a t-shirt that says autoethnography, it's not about you. Um, because I think that <laughs> that's, you know, that's kind of where people end. Um, it asks us to put ourselves in relation with other people. So I think autoethnography is one of the best ways to situate the personal inside of a larger, larger community. It could be your relationship with another individual. It obviously is about our, relationships with ourselves, but it's not only about that. Um, and and I, I said this already, but that's how you, when you're engaging with this, you, you ask your audience, your readers, um, to enter into a, a space of compassion with you, um, to take your story and to hold it in a way that's generous. And when we are in that space, then we can we can see the experiences of others that we have we have never touched. I mean, you've written so beautifully about this, Tony. The stuff that we don't get insight to, in ways that help us not other someone, not put them in the category where they're they're somehow less than or dispensable to us. And that's where that's where social justice can happen. So um, so I really. I don't think it's it's naive, and I don't mean this in a in a kind of Pollyanna way. I think it's it's research that does change us, and so then can change the world. Nice, well lit. Yeah. So uh, you've mentioned some something that I you know when I was thinking about this interview, something that I've never heard you ever talk about, and and, and I and I and I've wondered if this is just because it hasn't existed or you just like, I'm not going to pay this any time. Uh, you've mentioned some person, personal challenges in doing autoethnography, some ethical concerns, but have you have you ever faced any, I mean, you have a, not to be ages, but you have a long, <laughs> we are getting a long career <laughs> yes. in this stuff. Have, do you have, what are the professional challenges or criticisms that you have ever encountered and and we've never I don't I can't recall a single moment where we have had that conversation of the professional pushback and I then wondered well no has Stacy been you know has just hasn't been bothered with these or she just doesn't pay them any mind or is it a um, mm. or have you and we just haven't talked about them Oh, well, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Well, look, I mean, I, I, I'm speaking out of, uh, yeah, what's now a longish career. And I, and I just want to, before I, you know, dive in here, I just want to say things are very different now than when I was, than when I was starting out. 
Um, and so I don't, I don't take that lightly. Um, I also was um, from the beginning um, nurtured and taught that you can do what you want to do. You know that old adage, wait till you get tenure and then you can really start doing your work. And you know what? I mean, Art and Carolyn have told stories about being kind of educated in a particular way and then finding finding their way to, you know, the heart work. And, and, and so I know those stories exist prior to me during my time. Um, but, you know, I mean, I... I was taught by an iconoclast. I mean, Nick just always bucked against the system and, you know, he encouraged that. Um, and he he said, um, this is the work, you know, this is the work that you need to, to do. And so get busy doing it. Um, and then I, you know, I moved to USF and, um, you know, that or that system, that group of people was not without its conflicts or differences of opinions. Um, but I also, um, I also could sit in a in a faculty meeting next to Carolyn and Art um, and 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 also you know performance making colleagues and and so I always felt invited to do my work and so I did um, and um, and I think I tried to encourage students to do the work I still do that um, you know they'll say I can't possibly do my scholarship in this way because nobody will understand me and I can say I've all I've always done my work this way and I have been able to find colleagues and conversations and you we there are plenty of people on on the planet <laughs> who will love to see this work coming um, and will give you good feedback and will nurture you along so so there's that part I can also say you know, I, I moved from the US to Australia in 2015. Um, it's a it's a different system here that's much more interested in um, uh, <sighs> understanding what research is and quality research um, in a kind of system. It's very systematic. There are lots of kind of rules and, you know, vetting and every single thing that I publish is evaluated, first of all, to determine if it's research and second of all, determine if it's quality research. Mm -hmm. And that's to, the research is to meet the tests of research um, that are published that, that we follow, you know, every country has their own kinds of things. It needs to contribute to the stock of knowledge, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the quality piece has to do with where you might publish something um and so how's it been vetted has it been peer reviewed etc and so i've had to argue sometimes when my work has not been deemed to be research because it's too artistic um and here we kind of parse that into it's either non-traditional or traditional research um, and i am not a creative writer so my work doesn't fit in the kind of artistic research um, in a creative writing sense. So, um, so I've had to push back and I've also had to let go. Um, and one of the things that's been okay for me is I'm pretty productive. And so I can still meet my KPIs, uh, if you like, without having every single thing that I publish be counted. Um, and so um, I've had to kind of strike that bargain. At the same time, I am the person who gets that work to evaluate when they're not quite sure if it's research or whether it's, um, you, so I get to also weigh in for colleagues and make the argument on their behalf. So it's a little bit of a kind of irony, but also I take that role really importantly. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an important part of what I can do here. Um, it, it, Oops. You okay? Yes, sorry, you just disappeared. Okay. From I thought I got booted off. So anyway, that's a little bit of a kind of mixed bag there about about what's what's been challenging. Okay, yeah. Let's uh, let's open, we have, a, we have about 15 minutes. I wanna, anybody have comments, questions for Stacy? I have a few additional ones I'll make sure to ask but you know, I see Laurel Laurel you have Hi, Laurel mind. sorry about my blippy screen where are Hi. you we moved around 
Where'd she go? Yeah. Let's see. Where are you now? Is she still here? I don't find her. She's yeah, I'm here. here. My video is just being a little wonker, so yeah. Oh, okay. Um, thank you for talking about the Australian uh, professional part. I'm really curious about the living part. What's it like for an American, which you are, Californian even, I think, to move to Australia? What, what, how, how's that been? And that's an all ethnographic right now in the, in the presence. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's that been like? Oh gosh. I, you know what? It's been, it's, look, it's migrating from one country to another is a really, um, full on experience. Um, I think, I think that in some respects, everybody should do it once. Um, it's really challenging to kind of transfer your life from one context to another. And, you know, I moved to Australia, so it's English speaking, it's, you know, it's quite familiar um, in terms of the surround. Melbourne is the, you know, the second largest, nearly largest city in Australia. And so um, it's, uh, it's not without its kinds of conveniences, you know, it seems it's really, it's really wonderful living in, in a place that has great public transport. <laughs> to say um and it's quite beautiful here um some things that were really a little bit of a surprise i mean australians are think on one hand are pretty good about grappling with the colonial violences that that are part of the founding of this country um, and on the other hand want to suggest to me quite often that racism is something that exists in the US. <laughs> um, so uh, so I've, I've certainly uh, gotten an education and how to be better about just acknowledging the legacy of colonialism, but also reminding people that um, that racism is right here and not elsewhere, um, if that makes any sense. And um, uh, yeah, I also I also disabused myself of the belief, and certainly my partner Dan uh, told me this as another American who's lived in Australia now for I think twenty seven years, um, and I I thought Australia is really far away from everywhere, so it's hard to get places. Time zones are weird, um, and I and I thought, oh, I just really you know, everybody that I know is fairly intrepid. They're all good travelers, you know, I'll see them all. Um, but, you know, it's really, it's really a long journey to come to Australia. So it's also been up to me to travel to see people for the most part. Um, we do have some, some folks that are regular visitors. Um, but, uh, but I really thought, oh, no, you know, I'll, I'll definitely see people more. Um, and COVID was a really, Laurel, really difficult experience for us, particularly us here in Melbourne. Um, we had more lockdown than almost any group of people on the planet, except for in China. Um, and so uh, that that was really difficult. My parents are are aging, and so not being able to get home to see them was a real was a real hardship. Uh, travel something I took for granted for sure. Um, and I also moved a 13-year-old daughter to Australia. I don't recommend moving any 13-year-old, um, you know, uh, maybe from the living room to the bedroom and back, but not really not migrating them. Um, so um, she's still holding it against me, but very much happy that she lives in Australia. In fact, her passport is expired. And I said, we've got to renew your, your U.S. passport. And she just said, why? I'm not going back there. <laughs> and I thought, wow, okay, that's a, that's a big shift. That's a big shift. She's an Aussie for sure with an American accent. <laughs> Did I answer your question? You you nibbled around it. Yeah, thank okay. you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Hey, Sakina. Hi, Sakina. Hey. <laughs> oh, nice I to see you. <laughs> You know, we met briefly in, at our time at Cal State Northridge and you were yeah. so nice to me. I always remembered you. Yeah. Um, my question, you know, like if you remember, I'm a, I used to be a rhetorical scholar and I think maybe I still am, but I've been writing a lot of autoethnographic work that's been helping me uh, it's like therapy, it's therapeutic. And it's oh. also like, I feel like it's helping maybe other people, but we'll see. But I, I'm kind of like starting to wonder, if, and I was hoping you'd say a little bit about that. Are there any boundaries when it comes to autoethnographic writing? I can't seem to find 
if there are any or if there should be like what is not sayable is there any such thing <laughs> or is it just like um just depends on how vulnerable and how raw and naked you want to be mm, mm. um I guess I I guess my answer would be it depends um I think that it just depends on what you're trying to accomplish you might not know that going in I'm not saying that you know we just sit down and we know we know what the boundaries are but I think you have to write yourself into them and um I think that I think I think I've certainly gotten to um, what I might consider to be personal or relational or um, conceptual sometimes boundaries and written right up to them and then and then kind of, you know, maybe made a decision to either come away from some of it or to push further into it because that's where the important stuff is. Um, a, a very brief example would be my dad had a, a fairly um, significant stroke um, in 2000, what was it, uh, six. And um, one of the things that happened um, was that um, his kind of, his censor about things that he would say, which was never very pronounced in my father, just was gone. And so um, my dad, um, you know, it, it made our relationship different, but my dad is also um, somebody who holds fairly racist views, um, who who holds homophobic views. Um, and so part of what I was trying to write about was all the range of things that he might say, which were also sometimes hilarious, Sakina. I mean, he's also a really funny person, which was something I grew to appreciate about him. But I had to grapple with what to write down about what my dad said in a way that preserved his his humanity or that what I was hoping to do, which was the fullness of my relationship with him. I really didn't want to put him in a bad light, even though that's part of him, if that makes sense. Um, or I just, I'm trying to write right now about um, um, my mother, which is a fraught space. I haven't done a whole lot of writing about my mother who's really struggling with <laughs> over accumulation of things or what some people what you might describe as hoarding um and so i don't i'm trying to find the humanity in that and i'm trying to understand what that feels like from her point of view and not from a judgmental space so those are boundaries that i can't know until i'm really writing up to them um, i also think it's really interesting and i don't think i've cracked the nut on this about what you what you don't say and about right about putting work together explicitly that won't say certain things um tony i don't know if you remember but we did a piece together and i had done some writing about my daughter but there are some things that i won't say about my daughter and someone i remember a reviewer was really worried that um that in the things that i had omitted that there were other things at work um that I remember this. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I thought I understand how she got to that reading, but it was completely not what I was trying to not write about. But I realized I had failed in that moment and I had sort of left too much up for up for interpretation. And she had kind of gone in a way that was really she was really concerned about 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 what I had written. Um, so I think that it depends is, is gonna, I'm gonna stick with my answer there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm glad that you're doing this work. You're such a, you're such a beautiful and capable writer. Um, so I'm, I'm really, I'm really glad to see that, that you're doing the work. Yeah. Um, hey, Arta, yeah, go ahead, Laura. Just, just because you're writing it doesn't mean you need to publish it. So I would yes. say write, write it doesn't mean yeah. it has to go out to the world. Write it, write through it, write, write it, whatever it is, write it. You can always get rid of it. It's, writing is not your life. And the, your life you can't undo. Your writing you can't undo. So write it, no matter what it is. No, have no boundary. Oh, thank saying. you, Laurel. That's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Did you say, Art has a question? 
Art has one. Art, is that what you said? Art, put, Art put a question in the chat um, oh, about the how the experience. This is an Australian question again. Experiencing the role of government in life, academic or otherwise. Well, you just Art. completely skipped over in your response about being in Australia. Yeah. All the issues. The way Australia is presented in the American press is what we don't want to be. Yeah. You know. Um, and uh, especially in terms of the intrusion of the government in, in yeah. everyday Australian life. And is that how you experience it or? Um, I think that it's more complicated than that. I do think that there's um, definitely a more, I mean, this it's, I find it at turns kind of parental. <laughs> and parochial there's there's a kind of um you know directiveness certainly the the lockdowns were part of that um i certainly don't have any love for scott morrison and his inactivity in terms of making sure that we had access to vaccines so we weren't subject to kind of covid zero lockdowns for so long mm -hmm. um i do think too that um the it's been an interesting thing in an academic context that academic research is really well funded by the government. Mm -hmm. It's part of my life that I um, have to put, uh, you know, put together competitive grants. Um, but it's also part of my life that I actually have a really well funded, well, a few really well funded research grants to do research in theater and performance um, and mental health. Um, and so that's something I've had to learn to do. But also the government has right of refusal. So the education minister has to have final approval over some of those grants and has, you know, in the conservative government uh, regimes just vetoed what has been peer reviewed and a very rigorous, very long process, some really good research projects. And so there's a lot of pushback from the academy in terms of getting government out of that scheme. Certainly they want we, they want to fund research, but they don't need to have a right of refusal about which research gets funded. Um, and every year there are some really good projects that get that get vetoed and then have to be appealed. So, so it's a it's a bit of a mixed bag. I do also think that there's some real value in the government's investment in public services. Um, you know, things are easier here, although they are moving more and more into the private space, and things like health healthcare is becoming more difficult to access. So, I think I've mm -hmm. just gotten in on the last of the kind of. Mm -hmm you know, public funded education and healthcare days here. So um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, but also we're a small country. And so I think we're really beholden to some of those big, those big governments and, and our relationships with them, certainly with China and certainly with the US government, mm -hmm. <laughs> including the, the ex-president who shall not be named. <laughs> yeah. So to, we have a few minutes left. What do you, what is your, do you have any big ideas or messages of, of thoughts about the future of autoethnography? What do we need more of? What do we absolutely need more of? And what, what don't we need more of? It could be either. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we wrote a little bit about this in the introduction to the handbook. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, I think that uh, that the future is really um, trying to take on some of the you know enormous challenges that you know that face us now. Um, you know, climate crisis, um, violences against you know women, LGBTIQ people, people of color, um, so-called minoritarian peoples. I think we've been pretty pretty good historically about taking on some of those challenges, um, but also political fundamentalism, the breakdown of community dialogue and democratic processes, the threat to democracy, those are things that are, you know, pressing. I mean, if you read the news, um, I think that we have a lot to contribute to showing how to bring scholarship 
um, back into conversation with those pressing issues of the day. Um, uh, that's not to say, you know, um, uh, other kinds of research aren't important, but I think it's something that we're particularly um, well positioned to try and take on and 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 grapple with in a, in a meaningful way. I think pe the people on the screen are doing that work, um, and so I think uh, training others to to train their skills um, and hone their their abilities to address some of those problems is is really going to be going to be key and, and be important for us. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're at that time. Do any other folks have comments, remarks? Thank you all. Thank you, Stacy. This is. Are you becoming an Australian? I, you know what? Have... We... No, you don't have to here. You don't have to. So, um, yeah, we we got our citizenships last year, but we we are dual citizens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Stacy, I just want to say that. I miss you so much and <laughs> I'm listening to you just reminds me how much I miss having you here with oh, I, I miss you I miss all of you so much um, and I'm really I'm just crossing my fingers so I'll see some of you at ICQI this year yeah. in person um, yeah, yeah. I'm coming hell or high water as they say <laughs> all right we'll be there okay all right all right see you well Thank you, Tommy. Thank awesome. you so much Thank you. for this. Thank it you so much, fun. Stacey. Thank you for everything. Yeah, and thanks, Alec, for the recommendations. Yeah.